Ecclesiastics 12, 7 says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return to God who gave it. I welcome everybody on this beautiful day, this beautiful Sunday morning. The Lord has made. Let us join together, celebrate, and be glad in it. And let us appear to others as we would have them appear to us. Let us enjoy life. I have a few quotes to share with you today. The first one is, I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. Woody Allen, that's one of my favorites. And I'm always relieved when somebody is delivering a eulogy and I realize that I'm listening to it. George Carlin. <laughs> I bequeath my entire estate to my wife on condition that she marries again. That will ensure that it be at least one man who will regret my death. <laughs> <laughs> That's Heinrich Hein. If you die in an elevator, be sure to push the up button. <laughs> Sam Levinson. The worst time to have a heart attack is during a game of charades, especially if your teammates are bad guessers. <laughs> and that's Dimitri Martin. My grandmother was a very tough woman. She buried three husbands, and two of them were just nappy. <laughs> Rita, rude. When I die, I'm leaving my body to science fiction. Stephen Wright. And the last one, I am prepared to make, I am prepared to meet my maker. Whatever my maker is prepared for the great ordeal of meeting me is another matter. Winston Churchill. He was good too. Okay. Join me in invocation. Mother, Father God, Holy Spirit, as we join together here in fellowship, thankful for this beautiful, wonderful place you have provided. Surround us with the gold and white protective light and love as we ask that our angels, guides, masters, and all those being of the highest vibration and light join us now and assist us as we speak with those in spirit and share in thy word as you reach out with blessings and unconditional love and forgiveness for all. We pray that you touch world leaders with the spirit of love and forgiveness and still in them the desire to work together for all of humanity. Let us now join together in uh, saying the prayer that the Master Jesus taught the disciples. Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy will, will be done, done on, on earth as it is, it is in heaven. Give, give us this day, day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as, as we forgive, forgive those who trespass against, against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, welcome everybody. It's good to see everybody came out on this beautiful day. And uh, I'm delighted you're here. And uh, so now we're going to go with the music for this. Recently I ran across an article that talked about consciousness and the brain. And uh, it, uh, and then it, it uh, certified that people are really, even doctors and professionals, are really looking at the fact that the, the spirit, the self, is not part of the body, it is something separate. So uh, it was so interesting, that, and, uh, and it applies to spiritualism, so that's what I'm gonna share. I'm gonna review that for you today. <coughs> The new science of death, there's something happening in the brain that makes no sense. The new research into the dying brain suggests the line between life and death may be less distinct than previously thought. The 24-year-old woman was taken off life support and had been unconscious for more than 10 minutes. Paramedics found that her heart had stopped. Driven to a hospital where she couldn't be treated, she was taken to the emergency department at the University of Michigan. Their medical staff had to shock her chest three times with a defibrillator before they could restart her heart. She was placed on an external ventilator and pacemaker and transferred to the neurointensive care unit where doctors monitored her brain activity. She was unresponsive to external stimuli 
and had a massive swelling in her brain. After three days of a deep coma, her family decided it was best to take her off life support. Dr. Borgen had read about the near-death experiences of certain cardiac arrest survivors who had <coughs> undergone extraordinary psychic journeys before being resuscitated. Sometimes these people reported traveling outside of their bodies towards overwhelming sources of light where they were greeted by dead relatives. Others spoke of coming into a new understanding of their lives or encountering, or encountering beings of profound goodness. Borgian didn't believe the content of these stories was true, and she didn't think the sounds of dying people, the souls of dying people in those patients' brains. In her laboratory, she had discovered that rats undergo a dramatic storm of neurotransmitters, including serotonin and dopamine. After their hearts stop and their brains lose oxygen, she wondered if humans' near-death experiences might spring from a similar phenomena, and if it was occurring even in people who couldn't be revived. <clears throat> Dying seemed like such an important area of research. Dr. Borgian assumed other scientists <coughs> had already developed a thorough understanding of what happens to the brain in the process of death. But when she looked at the scientific literature, she found little enlightenment. To die is such an essential part of life, but we know absolutely nothing about it in the dying brain. Since the 60s, advances in resuscitation had helped to revive thousands of people who might otherwise have died. About 10 or 20 percent of those people brought with them stories of near-death experiences in which they felt their souls or cells departing from their bodies. Some patients even claimed to witness from above doctors' attempts to resuscitate them, and according to several international surveys and studies, one in ten people claims to have had a near-death experience involving cardiac arrest, or a similar experience in circumstances where they may have come close to death. <clears throat> As remarkable as all these near-death experiences sounded, they were consistent enough that some scientists began to believe that there was truth to them. Maybe people really do have minds or souls that exist separately from their living bodies. In the 70s, a small network of cardiologists, physicians, psychiatrists, medical sociologists, and social psychologists in North America and Europe begin investigating whether near-death experiences prove that dying is not the end of being, and that consciousness can exist independently of the brain. One of the world's leading experts on near-death experiences, Parina, uh, Parina, Pernina, something like that, <laughs> was uh, devising an international study to test whether patients could have conscious awareness even after they were found clinically dead. By 2015, experiments had yielded ambiguous results. That's why Borgenden, together with several colleagues, took the first close look at the record of electrical activity in the brain after a patient was taking off life support. Beneath the surface is a full account of how dying actually takes place, because there's something happening there in the brain that makes no sense. In 1892, the Swiss climber Albert Heim collected the first systematic accounts of near-death experiences from 30 fellow climbers who have suffered near-fatal falls. And in many cases, the climbers underwent a sudden review of their entire past, heard beautiful music, and fell in a superbly blue heaven containing rosette cloud <coughs> And in 1975, <clears throat> an American medical student named Raymond Moody published a book called Life After Life. In this book, he examined the reports of 150 people who had intense life-altering experiences in the moments surrounding a cardiac arrest. Although the reports varied, he found that they often shared one or more common features or themes such as a narrative of departing the body, traveling through a long tunnel, having an out-of-body experience, encountering spirits, 
and a being of light, one's whole life flashing before one's eyes and returning to the body from some outer limit. Near-death experiences, near-death studies were already splitting into several schools of belief. One influential camp was made up of spiritualists. Wonder who that was. <laughs> some of them in some of them evangelical Christians who were convinced that near-death experiences were genuine so sojourns in the land of the dead and the divine. The spiritualists collected the reality of life after death, and Moody was their most important spokesman. He eventually claimed to have had multiple past lives <coughs> and built a psychomantium in rural Alabama where people could attempt to summon the spirits of the dead by gazing into a dimly lit mirror. The second and largest uh, faction of uh, near-death researchers were the parapsychologists, those interested in the phenomena that seemed to undermine the scientific orthodox that the mind could not exist independently of the brain. These researchers who were trained scientists following well-established research methods <coughs> tended to believe that near-death experiences offered evidence that consciousness could persist after the death of the individual. Many of them were physicians and psychiatrists who had been deeply affected after hearing of the near-death stories of the patients they treated in the ICU. <coughs> Finally, there emerged the smallest group of near-death researchers who were the physicalists, scientists who studied the brain and were committed to a strict biological account of near-death experiences. Like dreams, <coughs> he, the physicist, physicalists argued near-death experiences might reveal psychological truths, but they did through so through hallucinatory fictions that emerged from the workings of the body and the brain. Their basic premise was no functioning brain means no consciousness, and certainly no life after death. Their task was to discover what was happening during the near-death experience on a physical level. Slowly, the spiritualists left the field of research for the domains of Christian talk radio, and the parapsychologist and the phys physicalists started bringing their death studies closer to the scientific mainstream. <coughs> Charlotte Marshall, a neuroscientist at the University of Ligue in Belgium, who had done some of her best physical work on near-death experiences, hopes we will soon develop a new understanding of the relationship between the internal experiences of consciousness and its outward manifestations. For example, in coma patients, we really are at a critical moment where we have new, have to disentangle consciousness from responsiveness and maybe question every state that we consider unconscious. <coughs> I think in 50 to 100 years time, we will have discovered the entity that is consciousness itself. I it will be taken for granted that it wasn't produced by the brain. And this is important, it doesn't die when you die. If the field of near-death studies is at the <coughs> threshold of new discoveries about consciousness and death, it is because of the revolution in our ability to resuscitate people who have suffered cardiac arrest. Lance Becker has been a leader in resuscitation science for more than 30 years. As a young doctor attempting to revive people through CPR in the mid-80s, senior physicians would then step in to declare patients dead. At a certain point, they would just say, okay, that's enough, let's stop. This is unsuccessful, time of death, 1.37 p.m. And that would be the last thing. But what really happened at 1.37? In a medical setting, Clinical death is said to occur at the moment the heart stops pumping blood and the pulse stops. This is widely known as cardiac arrest, different from a heart attack in, with, within which there is a blockage in the heart that is still pumping with loss of oxygen. 
Loss of oxygen to the brain and other organs generally follows within seconds or minutes, although the complete cessation of activity of this heart and brain, which is often called flatlining or brain death, may not occur for many minutes or even longer. As more and more people were resuscitated, scientists learned that even in the final stages, death is not a point, but a process. After cardiac arrest, blood and oxygen stop circulating through the body. Cells begin to break down, and the normal electrical activity in the brain gets <coughs> disrupted. But the organs don't fail irreversibly right away, and the brain doesn't necessarily <coughs> cease functioning altogether. There is often still the possibility of a return to life. In some cases, cell death can be stopped or significantly slowed, and the heart can be restarted and brain function can be restored. In other words, the process of death can be reversed. It is no longer unheard of for people to revive, even after six hours after being declared clinically dead. In 2011, Japanese doctors reported the case of a young woman who was found in the forest one morning after an overdose stopped her heart the previous night. And using advanced technology to circulate blood and oxygen to her body, <coughs> the doctors were able to reverse her more than six hours later, which is amazing. And she was able to walk out of the hospital after three weeks of care. Fantastic. In 2019, a British woman named Audrey Shulman, who was caught in a snowstorm, spent six hours in cardiac arrest before doctors <coughs> brought her back to life with no evident brain damage. In, in January of 2021, Netflix, uh, had an episode, uh, a series called surviving death, and in the first episode, some of the near-death studies, most prominent parapsychologists presenting the core of their arguments for why they believe near-death experiences show that consciousness does exist independently of the brain. <clears throat> when the heart stops within 20 seconds or so, you get flatlining, which means no brain activity. And uh, Bruce Grayson, a professor of psychology, psychiatry at the University of Virginia, and one of the founding members of the International Association for Near-Death Studies said in the documentary, and yet, people have near-death experiences when they've been flatlined for longer than that. Amazing. That is a key tenet of the parapsychologist arguments. If there is consciousness without brain activity, then consciousness must dwell somewhere beyond the brain. They're beginning to realize. <coughs> Some of these parapsychologists speculate that it is a non-local force that pervades the universe, like electromagnetism. This force is received by the brain, but it is not generated by it, exactly <coughs> the way a television receives a broadcast. And I've talked about that plenty of times before up here. In order for this argument to hold, something else has to be true. Near-death experiences have to happen during death, after the brain shuts down. To prove this, parapsychologists point to a number of rare but astounding cases in which patients seem to report details from the operating room that they might have, uh, that they might have known only if they had conscious awareness during the time that they were clinically dead. Dozens of such reports exist. One of the most famous is about a woman who apparently traveled so far outside her body that she was able to spot a shoe on a window ledge in another part of the hospital where she went into cardiac arrest. The shoe was later reportedly found in that spot by a nurse. Perhaps a story to be written about near-death experiences is not that they prove consciousness is radically different from what we thought. Indeed, the process of dying is far stranger than scientists ever suspected. The spiritualist, 
and parapsychologists are right to insist that something deeply weird is happening to people when they die, but they are wrong to assume it is happening in the next life rather than it is in this one. At least that's the implication of what Borgian found when she investigated the case of the first patient that I talked about. In the moments that she was taking off oxygen, there was a surge of activity in her dying brain. Areas that had been nearly silent while she was on life support suddenly surged with high frequency electrical signals called gamma waves. In particular, the parts of the brain that science considers a hot zone where consciousness became dramatically alive. In one section, the signals remained detectable for more than six minutes. In another, they were ten. Uh, in another, they were <coughs> eleven to twelve times higher than they had been before the ventilator was removed. As as she died, her brain was functioning in a kind of hyperdrive. For about two minutes after oxygen was cut off, <coughs> there was an intense synchronization of her brain waves, a state associated with many cognitive functions, including heightened attention and memory. The synchronization dampened for about 18 seconds, then intensified again for more than four minutes. It faded for a minute and then came back for a third time. In those same periods of dying, different parts of her brain were suddenly in close communication with each other. The most intense connection started immediately after the oxygen stopped and lasted for merely four minutes. There was another burst of connectivity more than five minutes and 20 seconds after she was taken off <coughs> of support. In particular, areas of her brain associated with processing conscious experience, the areas that are active when we move through the waking world and when we have vivid dreams, were communicating with those involved in memory formation. So were parts of the brain associated with empathy. Even as she slipped irrevocably deeper into death, something that looked astonishing like her life was taking place over several minutes in her brain. The brain, contrary to everyone's belief, is actually super active during cardiac arrest. Borgian said death may be far more alive than we ever thought possible. And there is something that binds the physicalists, the parapsychologists, the spiritualists, and all together the hope that by transisting the current limits of science, we will achieve not just a deeper understanding of death, a more profound experience of a life. That's the real attraction of a near-death experience. And I thought this article applied pretty good to spiritualism because what it proves is that our self is not part of the body like we believe. It is separate and uh, we, we have eternal life, we really do. And it, it's amazing that science is taking a good look at this and starting to come up with things that prove it. And uh, this, this article just uh, uh, amazed me so much, I had to bring it here and present it to you for your consideration. I hope you appreciated it. And thank you. Okay. And now, let us uh, prepare for meditation. No music. Okay. Let's see. We don't happen to have a small light, do we? Not anymore. Okay, Be begin by sitting in a quiet place. Mentally surround yourself with a zone of silence as if you have drawn a veil between yourself and the world. Gradually begin the slow rhythm of your breath. As you inhale, then exhale. Let your breath carry you deeper and deeper within deeper within. As the distractions of everyday life fall away, let your awareness drop down to the inner chamber 
of your heart. <clears throat> Next, imagine that you find yourself walking along a pathway that leads you further and further away from civilization and deep into the heart of a primeval forest. As you follow this trail, imagine that you are winding around and among trees that are hundreds of years old. Flowers carpet the ground and birds sing. In the distance, you hear the muffled roar of ocean waves rising and falling, rising and falling like music, just rising and falling. Your heartbeat, your breath, and the ocean waves all keep time with the rhythm of nature. Soon the path that you are on brings you to a tiny crumbling stone sanctuary, a place so old and hidden it had been forgotten by time thickly covered with vines and gnarled bushes, and intuitively you sense that there is something very mysterious, yet deeply familiar, lies within the ruins of this forgotten shrine. Slowly you push open the door and you enter. As you open the door, something old and timeless opens within you and your soul as well. Once across the threshold, you find yourself immersed in an atmosphere that is sacred and holy. Vaulted ceilings of ancient hieroglyphs arch over a rough stone altar at the front, <coughs> and candles are burning, and there is a smell of fragrant ancient incense. On the altar stands a statue of an ancient deity. It appears to be Egyptian sun god, Ra. It is so old and darkened with time and worn from handling that you cannot even imagine how it could have gotten here. Nevertheless, it is filled with enormous energy and surrounded by the light. Kneeling in reverence, you bow your head in prayer, immediately filled with divine energy and the cares and worries of the world just fall away, fall away. Soothed in loving acceptance of all your human faults and frailties, entering even more deeply in your meditation, more deeply. You are praying before the statue and it suddenly becomes alive as a real being. And now you find yourself before the mystery of ancient Egypt itself. As it comes to life, the chapel fills with a warm and golden light. The statue becomes animated with feeling. Seated before it, you gaze into its ancient eyes. Your soul is penetrated with a feeling of eternal life and a connection to ancient Egypt. Emotions of mercy and power emanate. They sweep over you in waves of bliss, healing all the parts of you that are hurt, broken or wounded, healing you unconditionally. You experience this power of the ancient Egyptian healing abilities. Going more and more deeply into this experience, you begin to feel as if the energy of the ancient Ra is the gateway to creation itself. You're now immersed into communion with the body of the earth. All her creatures, trees, oceans, rivers, and mountains, cities, and people, going even beyond the earth with a feeling that expands into space becoming the bodies of the stars and the planets and the whirling galaxies that are spread over the universe like a mantle of bright jewels. Held within the eternal mystery of life, you feel a powerful force, a holy energy, 
and the breath of life, the soul of the cosmos. You feel your heartbeat in rhythm with the rhythm of life itself. Slowly now, slowly now begin to return your awareness to your body, but still seated before the ancient one. Inhale deeply, taking into every cell of your body all the healing and every thought in your mind, the nourishing, life-sustaining, eternal energy. Exhale, letting this energy flow out of you like a river of grace, watering all that you care for with a stream of blessings, happiness, well-being, and health. Now, before you leave, bow once more before the ancient <coughs> Egyptian deity. Rise and exit from this humble little sanctuary, gently closing the door behind you as you leave. And as you make your way along the path back to life that you left behind, remember that you carry with each step a precious secret. Faith in the goodness of life and the gift of love and faith of healing from the divine. Now start feeling the energy in the room. Take a nice deep breath and return to normal consciousness. Return to normal consciousness, wide awake and feeling good. Wide awake and feeling good. Wide awake and feeling good. And let there be light. <coughs>